guys. Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is a Chapter 18 Origin and a History of Life review. Um, I encourage you, because this review will be fairly brief because we got interrupted by school tour, um, and we have a few lab questions, I, I would um, encourage you to look at the extended version that is located on your HyperDoc if you want a little more help on that. Um, particular review. So the first thing at least of critical importance in this chapter is to realize that there is chemical evolution and biological evolution. And so when we talked about them in stages, okay, and I'm going to jump ahead to something, where is my stair step? Right here. So on the chemical evolution part, that is how do you take inorganic molecules like these and get to organic molecules like these. That would be the very first step in that chemical evolution. And so you would need a source of energy to do that. And what was the source of energy that we discussed? Lightning. Could be what? Lightning. Lightning. Uh, UV rays, good. Could be what? Magma. Magma. Radiation. Radiation from the Earth's core. Okay. All of those could give the energy to provide to help these inorganic molecules that could have come out of what? Volcanoes to become these organic molecules. Now, how old is the Earth? 4.6. 4.6. And the very first cell at the top of our stairs here is how old? 3.5. Somewhere in there. So how many years passed? Yeah, 1 billion years, right? And a man named Oprin proposed a hypothesis that this could happen. That given the circumstances of the early Earth, the gases that were there, considering it was a what kind of environment? Reducing, Reducing environment, which is conducive to building. building. Whereas an oxidizing environment is like what we have now, because there's oxygen in our atmosphere, it's not building, it's what? Breaking. Because it was a reducing environment, the energy that you had available with the reactants that you had available that you could build these things. So Oprin proposed that, but a man named Miller actually did it. And in about a week's time, did he get these? Yes, yes he did. Okay, so that's saying that could happen. Okay, then your next step is to get from these organic molecules to these polymers. Okay, to go from monomers to polymers. Now, we know our key polymers that we have up here are what? Who are our two key polymers? Nucleic acids and proteins, right? And so, you know nucleic acids are built out of what? Nucleotides. And nucleotides are built out of what? Base. Phosphates. Okay, nitrogenous base, A sugar and a phosphate. So nitrogen would run low. There's an issue of that. So the issue of having a constant source because the, the reservoir for nitrogen is in the atmosphere is N2. N2 is diatomic molecule. Not helpful to building any of these things. We need to start with at least what? N3. Yeah, NH3. Exactly. So where could have been a source for this ammonia, this NH3? Hydrothermal vents, right? Because the conditions at the high, uh, um, iron, um, nickel, the heat at these hydrothermal vents could have generated that source of nitrogen, right? And then it's the big idea is like which polymer came first? It's a chicken and the egg argument. Did the protein come first or the nucleic acid that codes for the protein? And then we had Karen Smith who said, both could have evolved at the same time on clay. Right, do you remember that argument? There's the RNA first world, which says RNA can act as a substrate, but it can also act as an enzyme. We've seen that when we've looked at processing of RNA, we've looked at the functions of ribosomes, so maybe RNA came first. Then you have a man named, giving you a hint, Sydney Fox. Fox, who said who came first? Protein first. So there's different arguments out there. One argument that pretty much people agree on as far as nucleic acids go, because we we think in central dogma that the most critical thing is what? DNA and then codes for RNA and proteins. Maybe 
it's RNA first. We use RNA to code for our proteins, and then we store our RNA as DNA. Okay. So those are all the arguments on how these polymers could have come about. As far as Fox goes, he talks about these Fox's proteoid microspheres, which is when hot proteins cool. Yeah, they form a sphere. Oprin, the same one who hypothesized about early Earth conditions, said Oprin's quasarbit droplets, which are really about what? Fat. Fat, yeah. Fat, coalescing, and, and we know our current cell membrane to start our protocell. Remember, a protocell has a barrier, and our current barrier is a mixture of proteins and lipids, right? So it could have been a combination of either one of those that has our barrier and some sort of metabolism going on inside. What was the first metabolic event we think? Anaerobic or aerobic? Okay, cellular respiration or photosynthesis are we talking about here? Cellular respiration, yeah. So some sort of fermentation is going on here. And that you have metabolism and a barrier, you're a protocell. But if your cell can actually make more more cells. If you have a way to pass on your genetic code in some way and form more cells from it, then you're a true cell. And that first true cell was probably a prokaryote. It was probably a heterotroph, right? And the first type, you would have a heterotroph evolve first and then a cyclic Yeah, cyclic phosphorylation, and then later, non-cyclic, which generated oxygen. Once you have the oxygen revolution, you don't have to do anaerobic respiration. You can do aerobic respiration, and you can go from being <coughs> unicellular to multicellular. Perfect. Okay? So those, that's the key part um, of each of those. Okay? Then our next step was we got into... Fossils tell a story. We talked about sedimentary rock. We reviewed the types of fossils. And then that led us um, to talk about our geologic time scale. Okay? And when we look at the geologic time scale, we said how that gets set up is two types of dating. Right? What were our two types of dating? Relative and absolute. Relative and absolute. So relative, we're using like just layers. Right, superposition, which layers on top, bottom. We're assuming the layer on top is newer, the layers underneath are older. Perfect. Okay, and then we talked about um, absolute dating. One of the things you use there basically looking at what? Carbon. Yeah, well, it doesn't have to be carbon, right? Because that can only, that's, you, you know, there's certain fossils you can date with that, but anything with isotopes and, and the rate and speed at which they break down. Yeah, so you're looking at half-life, the time it takes for half of a substance to break down of that isotope into a more stable form, right? And then from that, we got our geologic time scale. Oh, we also, I got to throw this in there, we talked about the evolution of the eukaryotic cell, yes, and we already gave the evidence about that in the mitochondria and the chloroplast, right? Okay, so you could review that. When we look at our geologic time scale, this is like a super simple, okay? And the years aren't on here, but I know we can name them, okay? So let's start, we learn this. What era are we in right now? Cenozoic. It's this moment back to how many? 65 million years ago. How are we gonna remember that? Car. What are the two on the flora and the fauna, right? Flora is plant, fauna is animals. What are the two big things you think about in the Cenozoic era? Mammals and flowers. Okay, mammals and flowers. Remember, it's the last in our 24-hour clock. It's the last 30 seconds that gives you humans, right? Okay, all right, so that's Cenozoic era. What's right before the Cenozoic era? Mesozoic. It ends when the Cenozoic starts. So it ended how many? 65. 65. And it goes back how many? Yes. And who are we thinking about in the Mesozoic era? Dinosaurs, and cycads, um, gymnosperms are gaining their ascendancy, right? Then we go back, what's right before the Cenozoic era? Paleozoic. So it ends at what? Yeah, somewhere 225, 250, 245, 245 million years ago, and it goes back to 540, somewhere in there. Remember dinner time? 
It's car driving, school's out, dinner time. In the old and Paleozoic, that's when you see the beginnings of everything. Because animal-wise, you're going from invertebrates, you're going all the way to vertebrates, you're going to what? Yeah, fish and what? Before reptiles, amphibians, and then reptiles, right? So you get that far. And then plant-wise, you're going from algae all the way to the beginnings of gymnosperms. Flowers don't come until the very end of the Mesozoic era, right? They're, when they gain ascendancy is the Cenozoic era. So you're going from algae to gymnosperms. In the Mesozoic era, you're going from gymnosperms to flowers. And then in the Cenozoic, it's flowers to herbs. Animal-wise, Paleozoic, you're going from invertebrates all the way to the beginnings of reptiles. And the Mesozoic era is all about the reptiles and the beginning of mammals. And then the Cenozoic is mammals and up. Have you been studying these things? Okay. Then before the, I don't think so. <laughs> before the Paleozoic era is what? Precambrian, right? And your Precambrian time is from the beginning of the earth until about when? Yes, so your whole chemical evolution and your biological evolution until you're at algae and invertebrates, soft-bodied invertebrates. So you have notes that give you the years and all the key organisms. I know because I gave those to you, right? So that is not a comprehension issue other than I would logic it out knowing what evolved from what, right? You're not gonna have trees and then algae, right? You're gonna have algae and then trees, right? So just kind of logic that out. It probably would be a really good idea for you to draw yourself a simplified chart and do just the plants and the animals in it. I would highly, highly recommend that, okay? Draw yourself a little simplified geologic time scale. Okay, and then, let's see, oh, I forgot to mention this. What do you call a key fossil that kind of helps you date? Thank you. Okay, good. Um, last but not least, we looked at the importance of things like continental drift and our understanding of why you would see some fossils like everywhere, like when the continents were together, and you would see uniformity in the types of, let's say, plant plants that you had. And then you don't, it's discontinuous once the continents were separated from each other. And we always give the like biogeographical piece of evidence is looking at like mammals and how the continents were separated by 65 million years ago and that's when mammals were evolving because that's the beginning of the Cenozoic era. And so you see the great diversity in mammals. Whereas these ferns, you see uniformity. We talked about um, plate tectonics. Then we went and talked about mass extinction. You do not have to memorize the five mass extinctions in the exact year. We said that three of them occurred during the Paleozoic and two of them occurred during the Mesozoic. And when we looked at them like this, we talked about the great dying right here, right? And we talked about like large amount of species were wiped out. We talked about different reasons why they might be wiped out, but what does that do when you wipe out species? How does that contribute to evolution? Are you saying making room? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, making room for other species. You might see some adaptive radiation that occurs. I mean, when the dinosaurs are wiped out, that made it so there was more room in those ecosystems for what to evolve? Mammals. Yeah, it allowed those mammals to evolve. So you'll see like an explosion of organisms and then you'll see a pruning of those due to what? Nah, natural selection. Remember we see it all through the eyes of natural selection. You know, working on those phenotypes which ultimately works on those genotypes. So mass extinctions can lead to some, some of the great diversity that we see on this planet because it opens it up and lets things that are trying to evolve, it gives them room to exploit those environments. Okay, um, I had questions here at the end. I don't know if I asked every class, you're welcome to, let me see, I don't know how many questions are here. Login is your favorite, what? 
No, of course we are. No. <laughs> Your favorite potato chip, because I'm looking at her potato chips, and Doritos happen to be one of my favorites. What's your favorite kind of Doritos? Regular. I meant person, not person. Oh, okay, there, is that what you said, person? Oh, I'm like, person? So unlike you. Such a sweet girl. You're all no. Seven questions here for you. So I'm going to show the questions to you, and I highly recommend that you write the answer to the question, commit your answer to that question, and then um, you can check it here at the end. So here's question one. Okay, try to answer that question. Here's question two. By the way, that's a misspelling. I'm fully aware of that. <laughs> You're like, what is? Here is question number three. Don't announce the answers out loud. That just annoys people. They just don't want to say anything to you. Here's question number four. Here is question number five. And question six, again, Pause them so you can commit to your answer, so you can check for understanding, my precious children. And here's question number seven. Let's go, Chippendale. Jalapeno, pita chips from Trader Joe's. Potat, let's hurry up. And Potat, you're behind. Okay, I want to go over these answers, so make your last moment commitment here. All right, here we go. Guys, I want to make sure we address this so there's no questions, so let's just go over real quick. How can the general dates of geologic time scale, time scale be determined? All of these. Okay. Um, number two, when did angiosperms first evolve the Mesozoic era? Now, when did they gain? They, they first evolved in the Mesozoic, but remember they gained ascendancy in the Cenozoic. Remember we talked about how it rises up? Number three, continental drift explains all of those except B and F. Number four, when extinctions occur, new habitats open up for other species. That is true. Number five, 80% of the geologic time period is pre-Cambrian. Remember, that's in the billions. Our geologic time scale is not in the billions. What is it in? Millions. Okay. Number six. In the symbiotic hypothesis, it explains B and C. And number seven, um, it's Paleozoic area, era, and, and it's called the Cambrian Explosion, right? That's probably why that one first started. Okay, questions, concerns you want to ask me before we close it down? Yes? So when you say the continents like mirror each other? That's how they fit together like puzzle pieces. Africa and South America. Okay, wait, guys, I want to hear all the questions. Yes, that's called mirror. Okay. Yes. Um, I can't hear. Shh. The highly suggested Yes, it asks you to look at the tree of life. Yeah. Yeah, just look at it. Okay, so. Okay. Yeah, you don't need it. No, memorize it. <laughs> yeah, just look at it. So I just want you to appreciate it. Just have a moment with it. Yes, I can't hear. What? There is no. Highly suggested reading and thinking. Yeah. I said, look at that tree of life. I, I didn't say, but I just told you to look at that tree of life. What else? Anything else? All right. Be good. Make good choices. I will see you manana. You're welcome, sweetheart.